All right, Shalom. Before I get started, I want to give all glory, honor, and praise to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shah, Bahashem, Kurash. Double honors to the apostles and elders at GMS. Peace, honor, and respect to your brothers as I've been laboring, edifying, rightly divine the word, and truth and sincerity. And Shalom to you believers out there. As you can see, I got this video queued up called The Fall of Empires, okay, Rome versus USA, all right, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through this video and filtering it through the scripture, okay, because those of us in the know, we understand that uh, you, the United States of America, okay, is nothing but the revised Roman Empire, okay, and just like ancient Rome fell, Okay, that empire fell. Well, America empire is falling and it's going to fall. Okay, <laughs> thus said the Lord. Okay, we read about that in the scriptures. Okay, but like I said, those of us in the know, we know that this is nothing but Rome revised. Okay, <laughs> that's all it is. All right, and Lord willing, at the end of this video, all right, after I filter it through the scriptures, that you brothers and sisters out there be edified, okay, and if you really knew, you understand what I mean by uh, the country that we're living in, if you're in, in the Americas, is nothing but the ancient Roman Empire revived, okay, so I'm going to just start out with the video, and then I'm going to, you know, go to the scripture. Right now, the world economy stands at an alarming precipice. But would it surprise you to learn that the events of today are nothing new? All right, and that's, that's correct. It's nothing new. All right. As a matter of fact, Scripture tell you that when you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, it says, The thing that have been, is it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. See, and this is why, uh, you know, you see, you're going to see the similarities, the parallels between ancient Rome and um, the Americas. That's why they're able to make this documentary. OK. And even before this way, way, way before this documentary was made, it was recorded in the scriptures. All right. Give me the next few minutes, and I'll show you that there are Elizabeth. But would it surprise you to learn that the events of today are nothing new? Give me the next few minutes, and I'll show you that there are cycles to history that can not only allow you to see the future, but to make preparations for the very predictable outcomes. You're about to discover that huge financial gyrations, inflation, Loss of personal freedom and out of control government are all things that we have been warned about for centuries and are the. And see, you know, um, America, ancient Rome fell, okay? And you got to think about how America was built, okay? All right, just like ancient Rome, it was built off blood, uh, rape, robbery, murder. It was built on righteousness, okay? And, um, matter of fact, let's get that. When you go to Jeremiah 22, in verse 13, it says, Woe unto him that builds his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong that uses his neighbor's service without wages and giveth him not for his work, all right? And this is how America was built, all right? It was built off the blood, sweat, tears, rape, robbery, murder of the Israelites, okay? All of the tribes, all right? Not just, you know, Judah, okay? Because you had the Northern Kingdom that, uh, you know, went through the same thing. All right. It was built. This America was built off of unrighteousness. And this is why, you know, hey, it's it's going to fall. <laughs> All right. As a matter of fact. Like I said, it was built off blood. All right. And ancient Rome was built off blood. 
when you go into the history. When you go to Habakkuk 2 and 12, it says, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establish a city by iniquity. All right. And and all of these empires was built off of that. All right. It wasn't built off righteousness. OK. When you do your research and we all know how America was built. All right. The direct consequences of the monetary system itself. In fact, most world history is determined by monetary history. So what lessons can we take from the past to help us navigate the perfect economic storm that awaits us? Debasing a nation's currency supply to pay for public okay, works of economic storm that awaits us? The system itself. Inflation, loss of personal freedom, and out-of-control government are all things that we have been warned about for centuries and are the direct consequences of the monetary system itself. In fact, most world history is determined by monetary history. Alright, so he said most world history is determined by the money, basically. And that's true on a carnal level. But we all know that Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shah is in control of the rise and the fall of kingdoms. All right. And when you go to uh, Daniel 4 and 17, it says, the, This matter is by de the decree of the watchers, and that the Salaki, let me read it over. Uh, Daniel 4 and 17, this matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the Holy One. To the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men, and he giveth it giveth it to whomsoever he will, and set up set up it up over it the basis of men. And right now, the basis of men who's <laughs> in the kingdom seat is Esau Edom. Okay, but basically, that point I wanted to get is the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. All right, so you know. On a carnal level, yeah, you, you got money, the monetary system that determines it. But ultimately, it's Yahweh Bahashim Yahweh Shah who brings uh, whatever type of uh, plagues to the monetary system to make that empire fall. Or whatever plague that Yahweh Bahashim Yahweh Shah bring to an empire to make it fall. On the reverse, it's uh, what he do. It's in Yahweh Bahashem Yahweh Shah and his word, his decree, okay, uh, his power, okay, why an empire will rise, okay, see, so I just wanted to make that point. So what lessons can we take from the past to help us navigate the perfect economic storm that awaits us? Debasing a nation's currency supply to pay for public works and war is a pattern that just repeats and repeats throughout history, and it's a pattern that always ends badly. In this double episode, we're going to create a timeline to show the similarities between ancient Rome and the United States today. Just like the USA, Rome started out as a republic after overthrowing a monarchy. So let's begin with their early economy in around... Okay, so you see... They're building the parallels, okay? And this is what I'm saying about <laughs> the scriptures is on point with everything because, see, they're building a parallel between ancient Rome and the United States today, but the scriptures been wrote this out, okay? This is why they're able to do it because uh, the Americas is nothing but Rome revised, okay? America, Babylon the Great. All right, USA. All right. And matter of fact, when you go to, okay, this is nothing. United States is nothing but uh, Rome 2.0. All right. When you go to uh, Revelation 13, I'm going to start at verse 1 to get the context because the point is in verse 3. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. All right. And you know, I'm going to be breaking down some of it. So, you, you know, 
it can be properly explained, but I'm not going to go too deep into it. Okay. Like it's a Revelation 13 breakdown. But, uh, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and the sea being people and nations. Okay. And saw a beast rise up out the sea. All right. And see that beast is Esau Edom. But basically, in today's time, it's uh, the EU and NATO. Okay. <laughs> That's the beast. All right. Having seven heads. All right. And see them seven heads was Greek, the Greeks, the Romans, Germania, Germania Major, Germania Minor, the French, the Spanish, and Britain. Okay. So Rome was one of the one of them seven heads. All right. Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Verse two. And the beast. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, all right? And see, that leopard is basically dealing with uh, Alexander the Great in the Greeks, okay? And his feet were as the feet of a bear, all right? And the feet as a bear is uh, going into Russia, okay? And his mouth as a lion, okay? And the mouth of a lion is speaking about Great Britain. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And that dragon is the ancient roman empire okay that's the that's the you know that that's the uh dragon that gave the beast that power okay i mean that's the dragon that gave you know giving off the power verse three in the point and i saw one of his heads and it was wounded to death okay and one of the heads is rome rome the roman you know rome okay and it was wounded because it went down to the Byzantine Empire. And that's when the Jake ruled, basically the Israelites ruled, okay? That's why it was called the Dark Ages, okay? Continuing on in verse 3, and his, and his deadly wound was healed. And that's going into the Renaissance period, okay? That's when the Edomites came back into power. And all the world wandered after the beast, okay? So this is verse three, and I saw one of his heads it, as it were wounded to death. That's wrong. Again, I'm reiterating this again, so you can understand. So you know this for for people that's just coming in, and his deadly wound was healed. Okay, and that's the that's when he came. Rome came back into power. Basically, that's the Edomite Slaki. That's when the Edomites came into power. Was known today as the United States. OK, this is why it's the revised Roman Empire. That's why you see the parallels, because, uh, you know, the United States took, you know, customs and the ways of ancient Rome. And, and the further we get in this uh, in this uh, documentary, you're going to see that. All right. Even if we go to. Matter of fact. Let's do it. Um. And I'm probably going to go back here to Daniel. But when you go to Daniel chapter 7, all right, I'm going to read 7 just to get the context, okay? After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, okay? Because the first beast was the Babylonian, all right? The second was the Medo-Persian Empire. The third was the Greeks. And the fourth was the Roman Empire. OK. And behold, a fourth beast. OK. The Roman Empire, dreadful and terrible and strong as Sedum. OK. And that's going into a like military might. And just like in ancient Rome, their military might was very powerful. Well, the revised Roman Empire, United States, this is why they have a stronghold, because their military might is very powerful. All right. And continuing on to verse seven. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. OK, and this is talking about ancient Roman Empire. Now, verse eight. And I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Now, this little horn is different from the little horn in Daniel in the eighth chapter. All right. This horn, little horn is referring to America. OK, Babylon the Great, because it comes out of Europe, mainly out of Britain. 
Okay. So continuing on, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. All right. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. All right. And that's just going into, you know, them speaking proudly, the witchcraft. All right. The pseudoscience and mouth speaking great things. All right. And you're going to see <laughs> the parallels more that we go through this video. All right. So continuing on. 500 B.C. day. Just like the USA, Rome started out as a republic after overthrowing a monarchy. So let's begin with their early economy in around 500 B.C. In the early days of the Roman Republic, for the first 178 years, there's no evidence of big inflation. They were using gold and silver coinage mostly as their currency. Small denominations were made out of copper and bronze. Then Hannibal of Carthage starts to harass Rome in something called the Second Punic War. And to pay for this war, they did deficits. I want to make one more point. Um, and it said that Rome, I mean, it said that Hannibal of Carthage was a Jake man, was a so-called black man. Okay. I just wanted to make that point spending by taking the coins that they took in in taxes, melting them down, and adding cheap and abundant base metals, such as copper, so that they could mint more coins. This caused a big inflation, and the inflation was one of the factors that brought the Roman Republic down to a dictatorship, the Roman Empire. Most of Rome's gold and silver was stored in vaults under the floor of their treasury, which was also known as the Temple of Saturn. All right, and the point I want to make is they talk about Saturn. All right, these are the, the parallels, okay? Because when you go into Saturn, all right, Saturn, as you can see here, Saturn was a god in ancient Roman religion and the character in Roman mythology, okay? And it says, what is Saturn the god of? Saturn, Latin. Saturnus in Roman religion, the god of sowing or seed. The Romans equated him with the Greek agricultural de deity Kronos. Okay. But see when you when you look further, all right, Saturn, and you got something called Saturnalia. All right. And Saturnalia is basically what we know today as Christmas. As you can see right here, Saturnalia held in mid-December is an ancient Roman pagan festival honoring the agricultural god Saturn. See, Saturnalia celebrations are the source of many of the traditions we now associate with Christmas. See, see, and that's just one of the parallels, okay? Babylon, the great America is nothing but the revised <laughs> ancient Roman empire, man, okay? If you visit Rome, go to the Forum in the center of the city, where you can still find the ruins of the temple today. And here's something I found really interesting. The U.S. Treasury in Washington, D.C. has almost exactly the same design. You see? So now let's start filling in our timeline of events to keep track of the major similarities between Rome and the USA. We just learned that the early Roman Republic enjoyed a long period of practically no inflation because they used sound money, pure gold and silver. Interestingly, the United States started on the same path. From the late 1700s to the early 1900s, prices were very stable thanks to laws that mandated the use of gold and silver as money, and our people were not robbed by inflation. But in both instances, it was the ongoing debasement of the money for war spending and public works that led to economic chaos. Tell us the parallels between Rome and what's happening in the United States today. Well, they obviously two very different societies, but uh, there, there are some broad parallels. Rome was a republic. They made sure they had two people each year who were the, the rulers, the consuls. They uh, always change because the Romans were... Uh, All right, you see how they got two people, right? One in red, one in blue. All right, 
matter of fact, let's get that. <laughs> scriptures don't, the scriptures is dead on in all facets of life, man. When you go to Revelation 13 and 11, what do it say? And I beheld another beast coming up out the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, okay? And those, uh, those two horns are basically Democrat and Republic, Republican, okay? But see, in ancient Rome, they had something called plebeians and patricians, all right? And this is what I got queued up, all right? See, the patricians would be the upper class people, such as wealthy landowners would be in the patricians group, and that's what we would consider the Republicans today. The plebeians would be the lower class, which would be the normal people in Rome. See? And that will be considered the Democrats today. See? <laughs> All right. Worried they'd had a, Rome was a republic. They made sure they had two people each year who were the, the rulers, the consuls. They uh, always changed because the Romans were uh, worried. They'd had a monarchy before, very unpopular. They overthrew it. So they didn't want anyone getting too, much, too, too many powers. Uh, what did in Rome, no surprise. And see, that's, you know, they had, they, like, because they were very diverse. Okay, and I'm going to get that because, you know, um, everybody else had a, uh, you know, you would have a king and they would pass it to their son and then their son and pass it down. But see, Rome didn't do that. They 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 had, you know, a Senate house and every and this is where America get this uh type of system from. And let's get that. All right. Nothing new under the sun. When you go to first Maccabees chapter eight. All right. Now I'm gonna read Verse one, just so you can understand. Now, Judas had heard of the Romans, OK, that they were mighty and valiant men. OK, and and such as would lovingly accept all that joined themselves unto them and make a lead of amity with all that came unto them. OK, and that they were men of great valor. It was told him also of their wars and noble acts, which they had done among the Galatians and how they conquered them and brought them under tribute, okay? And this is what America does. If you in lead with America, hey, they'll show you love, basically. But if not, they're going <laughs> to they gonna trample all over you, all right? Now, jumping down, as you, I read that, so you can know that we're speaking about wrong. So when you jump down to verse 13, what do it say? Also that whom they would help to a kingdom. Matter of fact, let's start at verse 12. But see, but with their friends and such as relied upon them, they kept amity and that they had conquered kingdoms both far and now. All right. Just like America. And so much as all that heard of their name were afraid of them, just like America. Verse 13. Also that whom they would help to a kingdom, those reign and whom again they would, they displaced. Finally, that they were greatly exalted. Verse 14. Yet for all this, none of them wore a crown or was clothed in purple to be magnified thereby. Moreover, how they had made for themselves a Senate house. All right. And the United States have a Senate house. All right. Wherein 320 men sat in council daily, consulting all way for the people to the end. They might be well ordered. OK. And that they committed their government to one man every year. See, in America have what? A president every four years. That's this is why this is the Roman, ancient Roman Empire revised, okay? Because they took ways and customs and philosophies and all of that, okay? Who ruled over verse 16 again, and that they committed their government to one man every year who ruled over all their country. All right. Just like you got Biden today ruling over the United States, basically. He's a puppet. We know that. But he's the he's the face. He's the set up prince. OK. Continuing on in verse 16 and that all were obedient to that one 
and that there was neither envy nor emulation among them. See, so you see the parallels, the Senate house, the one man ruling every year. Now it's a little bit different because it's revived. OK, they still have a Senate house, but they have one man basically in power for every four years. All right. <laughs> Excessive taxation monarchy before very unpopular they overthrew it so they didn't want anyone getting too much too too many powers uh, what did in Rome no surprise excessive taxation and debasing the money when you look at the coinage it started out being an exact measure of copper for the sesterci and silver for the denarii and by the time it was all over worth absolutely nothing with perhaps a wash of silver to make it look like the original thing, which is exactly what we're doing now. So these patterns repeat themselves. They always repeat themselves. The Romans were the first culture to understand that a currency maintains its value because of its rarity. Julius Paulus once said, this device being officially promulgated circulates and maintains its purchasing power not so much from its substance as from its quantity. Even still, the Romans never stopped churning out more currency, just like the USA today and the ancient Greeks before them. But in their race to debase, the Romans came up with some new twists of their own. The first of these twists was coin clipping. Whenever a Roman would enter a government building, they'd simply clip the edge off of their gold or silver coin. They would save up all of those clippings melt them down and mint more coins, expanding the currency supply. And when that wasn't enough, they developed the art of revaluation, where you just take a coin and you stamp a new value on it. You got one, 100. <laughs> that simple. The move away from uh, precious metals to something less than precious metals, and the Roman Empire famously clipped their coins. Uh, this was a debasement of the currency. There wasn't a paper currency, but it was a debasement of the currency. In the U.S., there's a very interesting phenomenon going on where they're not clipping coins, but when you go to the supermarket, you find that the portions uh, of the uh, items at the supermarket on sale are shrinking. You know, the servings on various other consumer products are getting smaller and smaller, but this price is the same. So it's very similar to that old Roman coin clipping trick. Uh, from See, and that's the similarities because um you know, I remember uh, when we was younger, my mom used to tell us like candy me and my sister used to get that and her, when she was a kid, the candy was actually bigger. And of course it cost less. All right. And now if you look at, you know, I got nieces and nephews and things of that nature. When I look at how they buy their candy and stuff, I'm like, dang, that used to cost, you know, less and it used to be bigger. Okay. Like now and later, for example. I remember when I was a kid, they came in a big, long pack, all right? And you could probably get it for, like, 50 cents. But now you pay, you know, <laughs> almost the same price, but there it's only, like, four or five of them in there, okay? And I remember my cousin used to buy them all the time, and he would buy a pack and give me, like, four or five off the rip and still have a big, nice big pack, okay? And just, you know, just putting it in a, in, in a, in a lamest terms, basically. This is what they're going into, okay? <laughs> 2,000 years ago, it's, a, it's a, another form of currency debasement, but it's hidden through cardboard and marketing and fancy presentation, but the people are nevertheless having their currency debased. So why should you care about this? The quality of a society is directly proportional to the quality of its money. Stable money leads to stable prices, which leads to a stable society, whereas debasement of the currency leads to the demise of empires. The major reason for Rome's ongoing currency debasement was to pay for their ever-expanding empire and never-ending wars. The precious metals content of their coinage fell further and further until it had next to no connection with the pure gold and silver that had initially provided them with a stable economy. Cut to today, and we see the same pattern. 
Up until the outbreak of World War I, the United States had very high levels of precious metals in its coinage, and treasury notes were backed by gold at a one-to-one -one ratio. From there, the USA debased its currency more and more to pay for World War II, the Korean War, and then the Vietnam War, until finally, the link between gold and the U.S. dollar was severed completely. For See, and, you know, <laughs> that's, that's just like Rome. They stretched out their, their army thing. The United States doing that. Why? Because the United States is always in other people's business. All right? And they don't keep at home. Matter of fact, when you go into it, all right, as you can see right here, it says research conducted by the Jane Group and Geo Television Network reveals that the United States has been at war for about 225 of the 243 years since its inception in 1776. See, and that's well over 90 percent. All right. And you see these numbers, 225, 243. Uh, you see 222, 239. Either way it go, it's well over 90. That might be over 95%. 225 out of 243. That's a long time to be at war. As a matter of fact, let's look it up now. Um, yeah, here we go. Because, matter of fact, let me get this first. You go to Habakkuk 2 and 5, it says, yeah, also because he transgresses, transgresses by wine, he is a proud man. All right. Talking about Esau either. Neither keep it at home who enlarges his desire as hell and as is death and cannot be satisfied. OK, this man cannot be satisfied. He got the fatness of the earth, he got the world basically under his thumb and he's still not satisfied. All right. <laughs> and cannot be satisfied, but gather unto him all nations and heap up unto him all people. Right. And what do they call uh, America? A melting pot, man. All nations come here because, you know, basically it's the whore. You can come here, get your money. You got uh, other nations come here, they get money and send it back home. I mean, right now, you know, it's falling, but think about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. All right, you had nations, and even to this day, people still want to come over here. But especially in, in America, heydays, okay, you had all neat nations, what? Heaping unto him. All right, that's why in Revelation, they talk about all the nations was drunk. You know, all the kings was drunk off that wine. OK, and that wine is talking about philosophies and doctrine. OK, but see, he a proud man. He needs he don't keep at home. That's why when you do this research right here. Uh, how many U.S. military bases are there in the world? There are roughly 750 U.S. foreign military bases. See, they are spread across 80 nations. <laughs> All right. Yep, 750. All right. It might have went up. It might have fluctuated. But see, that's letting you know that Esau Edom is putting his territory everywhere, man. He don't keep at home. And see, this is something that Rome did. That's why they, they spread it out. All right. That's why they had to keep clipping the money, clipping the money, debasing the money. All right. And this is a cause. These are causes of the, the fall of ancient Rome and the same causes that's going to make the fall of Babylon the Great. All right. For those new to the series, let's revisit the pivotal event that has managed to sneak under the radar of modern historians as nothing more than a side note, even though it will have repercussions for generations to come. It was an unprecedented act of global debasement by a modern wannabe emperor that would make any Roman ruler hang his head in shame. Most people think that President Nixon's criminal activities were limited to wiretapping and spying on the competition. 
But his greatest crime came on August 15, 1971, when he severed the last ties between the dollar and gold, when he ended the Bretton Woods system. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The Bretton Woods system tied all of the world's currencies to gold through the U.S. dollar. But instead of running out and hanging the guy when he took us the world off of gold, the world just yawned and accepted that we were now on a fiat currency system, that we were now on this infinitely expanding system, that we no longer had money, we had currency. Money should be a fixed measure of value. It's like 5,280 feet in a, in a, in a mile or uh, uh, 12 inches in a foot. Uh, I gave you the example. Imagine trying to build a house, say uh, 2,500 square feet. If the foot changed each day, it was 12 inches one day, 10 the next, 20 the next, very hard to do if uh, that's changing. Well, the same, or, or the clock. I, I like, yeah, this. The, the, the 60 minutes in an hour. Imagine if they floated the clock. So you had 60 minutes an hour one day, 30 the next, 90 the next. You'd soon have to have hedges driven as futures to figure out how many hours you're working. You're baking a cake, I love this example. And it says, uh, bake the batter for 45 minutes. And then you have to figure out, is that inflation adjusted minutes? Is it a California minute, a Nevada minute? Uh, just makes life infinitely uh, complicated. So when uh, you have a fixed measure, uh, when you go to the market, you assume if you're getting 16 ounces of liquid, it's uh, 16, not 13, not 18. Uh, just makes uh, commerce, which is the source of wealth, people doing things with each other, infinitely easier. It is very odd that we've established a situation where what people do is scramble to borrow liabilities. Certainly, I guess, the most attractive liability in the world, or put a different way, the most attractive free trading lie on the planet is the U.S. dollar. We joke in investment conferences, it's the worst currency in the world, except all the others. If you're going to trade in a lie, it better be a liquid lie. <laughs> What the United States dollar has going for it is the most liquid lie in the world. I mean, if you think about the advantage that we have now, yes, it's, it's a horrible thing to do morally. But what we do is amazing. It's amazing that we can get away with this. See? And this is Esau Eno, man. They, like he said, we're printing a lie. Okay? <laughs> and he's smiling about it, man. This is, the, this is nat natural Esau Eno in his... In his uh in his form okay and matter of fact when you go to uh hmm. when you go to psalms 52 all right in verse 3 what do it say thou love is evil more than good and lying rather than to speak righteousness, a lie. See, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And that's what you seen that money coming out and what he said, he was printing a lie, okay? And he actually smiling about it. Um, when you go to Sirach 10, Ecclesiasticus known as Sirach as well, 10 and 8. It says, because of unrighteous dealing, injuries and riches got by deceit, the kingdom is translated from one people to another, right? And this is why Esau Edom is going down, okay? All right, because of unrighteous dealing, injuries and riches got by deceit, man. That's, that's, that's Babylon in a nutshell, all right? And that kingdom that's going to be translated from one people to another is these Edomites going to train their kingdom is going to be translated from them to the Israelites, okay? And our Lord Yahweh Shah is going to be spearhead, okay? <laughs> the ultimate Israelite. All right. Let me get one more. When you go to Jeremiah. All right. Jeremiah 5 and. 27 it says and this is when uh he was speaking to 
you know, Jerusalem, you read up, especially speaking of Israel, but we can, you can use this for Esau Edom as well. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and waxing rich, man. And this is exactly why America has waxed great, all right, because of deceit. And now it lets you know in Revelation, all right? We print a lie, a dream on a piece of paper, and we ship it to Brazil, and they send us coffee. And we ship the same lie to Germany, and they send us a Mercedes. And we ship the same lie to Japan, and they ship us a stereo. It's actually a pretty cool deal. I mean, I feel bad about it in a sense, but it's, it's grandly amusing in a sort of a cosmic sense. You see? He said, I feel bad, but it's grand. It's, it's amusing, man. This is Esau Edom. And you see how that he named off a couple of other countries. And see, like I said, deceit is how they got became great and wax rich. All right. And when you get um when you get Revelation chapter 20, all right. And I'm going to start at one. It says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. That's speaking about Yahweh Shah, verse two. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. All right. That's speaking about Esau, Edom. And then a thousand years go back again to when, uh, you know, Rome, they had failed. All right. And Jake was ruling and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. See? And what did it say in uh, verse 27 of Jeremiah 5? It said deceit by deceit. All right? Continuing on to verse 3, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And right now, we are in that little season. Okay? Because when you jump down to verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. All right. And that's not the spiritual demon Satan. That's talking about Esau Edom in this American empire. When it was in the, in the uh, Renaissance era, in the Renaissance period, when they was coming back into power. All right. Matter of fact, hold on. Bear with me just one sec. I'm looking up something on my computer. Yep. Okay. So, um, verse seven again. And when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loose out of his prison. Okay. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. And you see how it was like, oh, we print up a lie in Japan. Give us this. We print up a lie in Germany. Give us this. We print up a lie in Brazil. Give us this. See. And this is how they're waxing waxing great okay this is how they became great in power okay printing lies like my man said so continuing on in verse 8 god and Magi to go to gather them together to battle and the the number of whom is as the sand of the sea all right but see the point i wanted to get was and shall go out to deceive the nation because you see in verse 7 what did it say when the thousand years are expired satan shall be loosed all right, and that's speaking about these Edomites. Okay, they came back into power. And matter of fact, this is what I want to get. I didn't have this down, but it just came in my mind when you go to Malachi 1 and 4. What did it say? Whereas Edom said, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus said the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness. OK, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked and the people against whom the Lord have in the nation forever. See, and this is because, you know, the Lord said we're going to war with Amalek forever. OK, and see Esau, Edom, they're going to go into slavery. They're going to go into captivity when, once this empire fall and they're never going to rule again. Like at, when they um was loose for this little season, this is the little season we in now. Well, when they go back into. uh captivity when they go back into being a no people they're never going to rise again all right <laughs> you just need to under okay. mercedes and we should 
print a lie, a dream on a piece of paper. And we ship it to Brazil and they send us coffee. And we ship the same lie to Germany and they send us a Mercedes. And we ship the same lie to Japan and they ship us a stereo. It's actually a pretty cool deal. I mean, I feel bad about it in a sense, but it's, it's grandly amusing in a sort of a cosmic sense. You just need to understand that somehow, sometime, some way, there's going to be a reckoning. See, there's going to be a reckoning, man. And a lot of these Edomites can feel that in their spirit. And it will be a reckoning. All right, thus said the Lord. The reckoning will be America will fall. You Edomites are going to fall as a whole, as a nation. And you're going to go into slavery. All right, that's going to be the reckoning for y'all. The dollar is involved uh, worldwide as a major currency, so it's one half of everything we do. And it has no definition. I used to get a charge out of asking Bernanke and Greenspan, define a dollar. And, you know, they can't define a dollar. They, you know, in the old days, it was a weight, a weight of silver, a weight of gold, and, and that's what it was supposed to be according to the Constitution. Well, Dr. McCracken, not being an economist, can you explain to me briefly, how in the world do you determine what a value of a dollar is in relation to a French franc, for instance, if you can't convert that dollar into gold? What standard do you have? What is it worth at all? You determine that's going to be determined in the marketplace, just as okay. really largely it has already. So well, what is this going to do then to, uh, for instance, the speculator in gold? How is this going to affect him? Is well, the price going to drop or rise? The, uh, the the official price of gold, of course, has not been changed. That was not, uh, that was not a part of this program at all, nor is that contemplated. Well, maybe they should have contemplated what was likely to happen because for anyone who had studied history, the outcome was perfectly clear. Rather than help the economy, Nixon's actions made things a lot worse, and the public started feeling the effects of inflation much more acutely. It was hard for savers to keep their heads above water unless they had saved in the ultimate stores of value gold and silver. Just as it had always done throughout history, gold once again accounted for the expanding fiat currency supply by rising in price to cover that supply. Gold had done this as recently as 1934, when the USA's debasement really started heating up and gold was revalued from $20.67 an ounce to $35 an ounce. Now the process began again as the public bid the price up from $35 an ounce in 1971, climbing all the way to $850 an ounce in 1980, easily accounting for the massive quantities of currency the USA had conjured out of thin air now that Nixon had removed all restrictions. Gold had once again held an out-of-control currency to answer. Getting back to the Julius Paulus quote about the value of a currency being decided by the quantity rather than the content, one of the biggest economic hurdles that mankind repeatedly trips on is that we have never been able to control the quantity of currency. And this is one of the reasons why gold has always been the ultimate money. It can't be printed and it keeps us in check. Today, I think cryptocurrencies are a very exciting development and have tremendous possibilities. The bottom line is that governments have a long history of trying to cheat gold either through debasement or manipulation of the markets, but here's the thing. In the end, gold always wins. And that brings us back to the Romans, who went through many cycles of currency debasement for war spending, then inflation being felt by the public, then revaluation of the currency, then more debasement for deficit spending on war, resulting in even more inflation being felt by the public. The cycle repeated again and again. Those who were able to hold gold outside the official system maintained their purchasing power. Those who did not suffered greatly. In 270 AD, Emperor Aurelian took power and had the now worthless official coinage recalled and minted again to contain a small amount of silver, just 5%. This act brought a new vitality to Rome, but unfortunately it was short-lived as government after government gave in to the temptation of spending beyond their means. Eventually, wars were funded by levying huge taxes on businesses and the rich. This only had the effect of closing down many essential businesses. The more meddling the government did with And you see, this is some of the, a lot of the same things that's going on today, all right? <laughs> the economy, the worse things became. The government started confiscating private property by force to fill their empty state coffers. Rome 
was sliding into ruin. And that brings us to Emperor Diocletian. His actions are the first recorded example of the following hidden secret of money. Wage and price controls do not work. He came to power as inflation was surging, but his decisive actions only added fuel to the fire. So because the economy was getting worse and worse, Diocletian created a whole bunch of great government solutions. He created a bunch of works projects. He hired, he hired a bunch of the homeless and, and uh, people that were unemployed, made them soldiers and government employees. And this caused deficit spending to just go out of control and inflation raged into what is known as the first documented hyperinflation. So to get inflation under control, in 301 AD, Diocletian issued his infamous Edict of Prices. This was a massive volume of a, a list of all of the wages and the prices people could charge for goods and services. And it was all enforced under the penalty of death. So what happened was uh, instead of risking your life to sell something at a profit so that you could stay in business, people just closed up shop. Instead of doing a job that was listed in the book that was below a living wage, people quit their chosen career and, and tried to pursue a job that wasn't listed in the book. The result of this was that Diocletian came out with a law that said every son had to go into his father's business under the penalty of death. And this <laughs> death, you know, and them draconian laws are going to be coming today coming back, all right? You know, Esau, you don't have certain laws that just sets you up for failure, all right? And just like ancient Rome, <laughs> hey, it's played out today. So when you go to a... And this is why they civilizations fall, man. This is why, you know, the Edomites are not they weren't meant to have a perpetual kingdom, all right? They weren't set up for that. They were only set up to have the fatness of the earth for a certain period of time. Because, see, the Lord, Yahweh Bahashim Yahweh made Israelites to be naturally righteous and Edomites to be naturally wicked, all right? And this is why you see <laughs> the world in the condition today. So when you go to Isaiah 10 and 1, what do it say? Woe well, unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. All right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, let's back it up with uh, you know, Micah 2 and 1. Woe well, to them because you see how he made all them laws and it had a penalty of death. Then when people was like, all right, we ain't going to do it so, you know. We just going to close down and find something that ain't in that book. What do you do? Well, now everybody got to do a trade of their father. So they, they, they put you in a trick bag. All right. And if you don't do it, it's the penalty of death. Why is that? Because this man is, is, is the devil, man. You see what I'm saying? And just like in ancient Rome, okay, this is the revised Roman Empire. All right. Why is that? Because you have the same spirits coming back. All right. These, these Edomites walking the day around the day is nothing but a lot of them that was around in the uh, ancient Roman Empire. OK, so Micah 2 and 1, it says, woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. All right. And see, he had the power to to do whatever was, in, you know, whatever he just thought up. <laughs> And that's why when they was like, oh, we just close down and do a, a job that ain't in the book. No, you got to take up a trade, you know, because in the ancient world, you know, a son, he basically took the trade of his father. So and he knew that. So that's why he said that. No, you got to take the trade of your father. All right. And most of the trades was in that book. They have, you know, Esau Edom do that diligent search and that read and with that research, he already knew you know what was the basically the hot job can you put them in that book <laughs> all right when governments start meddling with an economy the result is always the same prices become distorted this is a huge danger because prices act as a signal for an economy they indicate to producers and buyers where true value lies the outcome is always economic turmoil shortages and black markets 
We've seen what happened to gold when Nixon started his economic interference. So now let's go back and see what happened when Diocletian started his jumbo-sized meddling with the economy. We know when Diocletian created the Edict of Prices that the price of gold was 50,000 denarii per pound. And then we also know uh, from transaction receipts around 50 years later, the price of gold had risen to 1 billion 200 million denarii per pound. That's a 42,400 percent hyperinflation over a 50-year period. That would be similar to if gold was $35 an ounce 50 years ago. Today, one ounce of gold would be about a million and a half dollars. Another analogy that I can make is if an average family car was about $2,000 50 years ago, today it would be selling for $85 million. Just imagine $85 million on the windshield of a, of a car at a car lot. That's the type of inflation these poor people suffered through. Well, wait, wage See? And that's, you know, that's, a, uh, that's them diverse ways. That's, you know, as a matter of fact, let's get it. Because it came, you know, came to mind. When you go to Proverbs 20, all right, in 23, it says, Diverse weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. See? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And you, it, it, it's, it's not good always to, you got to be balanced. It's good to be balanced in all facets of life. OK, if you got somebody that's just, you know, uh, 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 what, what's a good example, you know, false balance, you know, if you eat, you know, you just drink water all the time, you know, that's not good. You need, you know, you need some food, you need, you know, salad, meats, things of that nature. Well, if you just eat chicken all the time, that's not good. If you eat candy all the time, it's not good. You need a balanced diet, okay? You need, you if you exercise all day, every day, exercise is good, but if you do it all day, every day, it's not going to help you. It's going to harm you, okay? Sleep is good, but if you sleep all day, it's not going to be good. Working is good for uh, people to make money, but if you work all the time, it's not going to be good for you, okay? <laughs> so, again, t uh, Proverbs 20 and 23, diverse weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good, all right? And these goes into these uh, diverse, I mean, yeah, these diverse weights, all right, with, you know, this money, that monetary system. Because as you see, it was some crazy things. Let's Price control. Just imagine 85 is if an average family car was about $2,000 50 years ago, today it would be selling for $85 million. Just imagine $85 million on the windshield of a, of a car at a car lot. That's the type of inflation these poor people suffered through. Well, way wage and price controls, uh, upends an economy, gives more power to the government. Uh, what are price controls? Prices are supposed to convey information. That's what markets are about, knowledge and information. So a price will tell you something is dear. Oh, get out and produce more. Uh, the price is low, maybe you're produ uh, producing too many of it. So it's a way of conveyance of information. So you devote your efforts to something that people want, not what a bureaucrat dictates. So when governments uh, trash the money, and uh, your uh, prices, nominal prices are going up, uh, the government response is, oh, they're greedy speculators or merchants or whatever, and so you say you can't charge as much. Well, what that means is you get a black market and you hurt the production of the thing. The idea that government can substitute for uh, people interacting among themselves is preposterous. This pattern of failed price controls is something we see throughout history and across the globe. Skip forward over 1,500 years, and governments still hadn't learned their lesson. During the chaos of the French Revolution, see, they ain't learning a lesson because that's the point I was going into about reincarnation. All right, because you have the same spirits that's coming back today that are back, and a lot of those spirits that 
are in power now were in power in past times. This is why they're repeating the, of the cycle because everybody is in a lot. Okay, the believers, they're in their lot. The believers now were the believers of old. The, the, the scoffers of old was, is the scoffers of today. Okay, the false teachers of old are the false teachers today. The, prop, the, the, the prophets that teach in the right way, they were the prophets that was teaching in antiquity. Okay, so everybody's in their lot. This is why you keep seeing history repeats itself. And that goes back to what? Ecclesiastes 1 and 9. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay. And the government issued a set of wage and price controls known as the Law of Maximum, also imposed under the penalty of death. It's worth noting that when wage and price controls are implemented, government always tries to deflect attention away from the problems that it has created itself by shifting the focus to businesses who are labeled as greedy hoarders or price gougers. In reality, most are just average people trying to keep their business afloat, doing their best to and see that's what goes on today all right because you have uh these big wigs and these you know these uh the the, the rulers you know they want to track the carbon footprint they talk about global warming and how we need to do this and we need to do that yet they're the people that's really doing the most damage because they're in control of the port they're in control of the uh garbage control they're in control they have the the big plants and manufacturer pl manufacturing plants and uh things of that nature that cause all these greenhouse gases and global warming they're doing the most pollution throwing things in the oceans and the seas the average person walking around here they don't have control of boats and things of that nature okay <laughs> but see this is what was in Pat in antiquity and is rolling around again. Like I said, reincarnation. Okay. Deal with the unstable supply and demand curve created by government meddling. And France was no exception to this blame game. During the law of maximum, many innocent people were executed, food shortages developed, and black markets ruled until finally, 15 months later, the act was repealed because it didn't work and all the stored up energy of government manipulation was unleashed at once, leading to a further period of chaos and inflation for France. I agree with Steve Forbes. The idea of wage and price controls is absolutely preposterous. Now we'll skip forward another 200 years and government was at it again. Many people don't realize that Nixon's speech from 1971 also included the announcement of a 90-day wage and price freeze. The United States was suffering from big inflation thanks to deficit spending for the Vietnam War. Silver had been taken out of circulation in 1965, reducing our coinage to worthless flecks of base metal, and the paper currency supply had been expanded greatly. Did that sound familiar? Just like Diocletian, Nixon's team of economic boffins thought they could curb inflation by fixing wages and prices. The time has come for decisive action action that will break the vicious circle of spiraling prices and costs. I am today ordering a freeze on all prices and wages throughout the United States for a period of 90 days. Working together, we will break the back of inflation. You'd think that these people would learn from history, but they don't. To get an idea of how out of touch the men with their hands on the economic levers were, Listen to what Nixon's advisor had to say about the duration of the controls. Would it be your anticipation that it would take more than 90 days to break the back of inflation, as the president put it tonight, uh, that uh, there would have to be a further extension of an actual wage price freeze? I would not, uh, no, I wouldn't, uh, I, I don't think one can say that uh, uh, it will necessarily uh, uh, take longer. Uh, we're, uh, we're sailing to some extent in an uncharted sea here. Uh, but uh, this, uh, uh, this, I think, is, is a reasonable estimate of the time that's going to be required. Dan Rather. President Nixon is expected to speak for about 15 minutes on his new economic policies. The president's address tonight comes against a background of the following facts, among others. Record high gold prices and rapidly increasing cost of living figures for most Americans. 
the wholesale price index rose by 2.1% during the month of May. The index of industrial commodities in the last three months has risen at an annual rate of 15.9%, the worst since the Korean War 20 years ago. All of that part of the general background of the President's remarks tonight. Every American family is confronted with a real and pressing problem of higher prices. And I have decided that the time has come to take strong and effective action to deal with that problem. Effective immediately, therefore, I am ordering a freeze on prices. This freeze will hold prices at levels no higher than those charged during the first eight days of June. It will cover all prices paid by consumers. What was Albert Einstein saying? What kind of an idiot would do the same thing over and over expect, and expect different results each time? And it's the same pattern that's happened repeatedly, cycle after cycle after cycle after cycle for thousands of years. Okay. You see, that's because why? Reincarnation, all right? <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. She borrows itself into bankruptcy. It creates more money to try to pay its debt. Prices go up. People rebel. The whole system falls apart. And I'm scared about it. Countries collapse over this. They go to war about this kind of thing. Rebellion in the street. Overthrows of government. The whole nine yards. There is nothing to be gained from inflation and everything to lose. And we're going to lose everything. And this, this is uh, talked about in the scriptures. All right. <laughs> Jacob's trouble is one of these, you know. But see, Esau, Edom, and the rest of these nations wasn't given law, statutes, and commandment to have a righteous setup like the Israelites were. All right, and that's why in our heyday we was it was all good, okay. But see, when the kingdom of heaven is established on earth, it's going to be perpetual. Because it's going to be under righteousness, okay? Because it's going to be under law, statutes, and commandments of Yahweh, <laughs> okay? Which passed down to Yahweh Shah, and then, you know, everybody in their respective order, okay? Yahweh Bahashem Yahweh Shah is going to rule in righteousness. This is why our kingdom is going to be perpetual because Israel is going to have them laws in their um, inward parts, which Esau, Edom, and the rest of these other nations did not receive. This is why they come into power, fall out, come into power, fall out. And this is why they're they're not um they're not the chosen. This is why they can't have a perpetual rulership. Okay? So when you go to uh hmm, see, this will make us special. Deuteronomy chapter four, starting at verse five. Cause see, we had laws and um we had laws and for for money and things of things of that nature. All right, we had a a, a setup. So when you go to Deuteronomy four and five, it says, "Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my power commanded me, that ye shall do so in the land whether ye go to possess it." Okay, keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nation, see, which shall hear all these statues and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who have God so not unto them as the Lord our power is in all things that we call upon him for? Verse eight, and what nation is there so great that have statues and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day, see, and this is what made us wise in front of the nations. And this is what is going to make us wise again in the sight of the nation. OK, <laughs> that's why coming back to Yahweh Bahashem Yahweh Shah. All right. It please our power. But see, it 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 um in the sight of these nations, even two thirds of our people. It makes you a wise and understand. It makes you. It it ha, it gives you the wisdom. All right. It gives you the understanding inside of these nations. Now, of course, a lot of them is blinded. So you know, we may come across off to certain people. But see, in the kingdom, this is what's gonna make us 
wise and understanding in their sight. <laughs> this is what they're going to be saying. And this is why Israel is going to be a perpetual rulership that's never going to fall off, never going to flop. OK, because we're going to have all the laws in place. You know, even in antiquity, we had laws in place where even if an Israelite brother or something fell out of, you know, he fell on hard times. Well, he we have systems in play where he can bounce back and not be, you know, in debt forever. Unlike Esau, Edom. They'll keep you in debt until you in the casket. Okay, it's something you can do at 16 that can have you in debt forever under this man's rulership. You know, we had laws. We had law jubilee. We had laws for, for murder. We had laws for everything, even a dietary law to help you eat healthy. Do Esau eat them have that? No. He give you, he take um abominations according to the dietary law, and make them delicacy. And see, this is why this man rulership will never, uh, never just last, okay? In, in a human, in our human form, it lasts for a lot of years. But see, compared to our rule, our kingdom, okay, it's going to be a spark, okay? It's going to be nothing. Them thousands of years, hundreds of years, whatever, it's going to be nothing compared to eternity, all right? So, you know, that was my last, that was my last scripture. Um, I'm going to just let it play out a little bit more. Around the world, people don't seem to realize that government intervention always makes things worse. It's the government manipulating things. Whenever you manipulate something and try and control it over here uh, and, and not allow the free markets to balance everything all by themselves, something comes squirting out way over here that you just don't expect. For instance, the doc... As a matter of fact, hold on, let me get another one. Uh, now in Proverbs 28 and 8, it said, He that by usury and unjust gain increases his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. And when you get into the uh, NLT, it says income from charging high interest rates will end up in the pocket of someone who is kind to the poor. See, <laughs> that's why the scriptures say, uh, you know, Esau Edom is going to uh, cough up his riches. All right. Roughly paraphrasing. OK, but like I said, like I was going into the laws that were given to us. We had systems in place, okay? It just was through our disobedience why the Lord took us out of power, all right? And that was just all uh, to fulfill biblical prophecy. But see, once Israel is set back on high, we never fallen off because those laws will be in our inward parts, all right? And with the law, statutes, and commandments, that's our wisdom to just continually stay on top, which wasn't given to these other nations, again. That's why Esau Edom rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall. And even though, you know, Israel had a rise and fall thing this this last time, when we when we come into power this this next time, it ain't gonna be no falling off. Okay, so pretty much that's all I had. You know, Lord willing, it was edifying. You know, I want to get the similarities between ancient Rome, okay, and in the Americas today, the ancient Roman Empire and the revised Roman Empire, which is America, aka Babylon the Great. So, again, Lord willing, it was edifying. If you got any questions, just leave it in the comments. And to the next lesson, Shalom.